Hi everyone, this is Ramanuj from Law Seco and uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar. With us we have Abhi Roy, who is a co-founder of Sarvada Legal and has uh, uh, many years of experience uh, in, in working in competition law and he was also a partner at Lakshmi Kumar uh, before LKS, right? So, uh, so it's a great opportunity for us to learn from Abhi. But before we do anything else, Abhi, why don't you start by telling us your uh, your experience so far uh, as a lawyer and what you have been doing like uh, i'm sure not everybody knows uh, your exact background so far so maybe let's start with that sure so uh, uh, hi everyone thank you for joining in and i hope everybody is safe at home during these testing times uh, so thank you once again for joining in a uh, brief introduction about myself uh, so my name is abir i am a passer from jodhpur in 2007 so uh, in 2007, I joined Nishad Desai for a couple of years doing m and and then I shifted to competition law ever since 2010. And I've been working in competition law in th uh, three other firms before I started on my own along with seven other, six other partners. Uh, so overall, the journey has been, I started with like corporate m and but I gravitated towards competition law, primarily litigation. So I've seen a full circle from uh, drafting contracts, m &A contracts. So now I have nothing to do with corporate, but mostly I'm in courts uh, handling competition law matters. Got it. So, uh, so if you can just uh, tell us, like, you know, what has been your experience of uh, Sarvada Legal so far and tell us more about Sarvada Legal also, what you have been doing. Yeah, so, uh, so a brief background of our uh, firm. Uh, so I have always believed that uh, so we always, uh, I had this uh, idea that uh, to start something on my own, but it was never an intention nor my belief that we should start solo. Rather, I was always looking at a team of like-minded people. So luckily, three, three or more people from my college who were all working in Lashmubar and Pridharan and three others, we formed this firm called Sarvada. Sarvada is actually a seven letters, so acronym of seven partners. So it has a nice ring to it which means always, and it, uh, it's actually an acronym for seven partners. I'm one of the A's and three A's in Sarvada. Uh, as far as my firm goes, uh, I look after the competition of practice. We have a general uh, litigation team also. We have a team which specializes in international trade. We do a lot of matters for the WTO and, uh, and the works like anti-dumping, subsidy, etc., which is handled by a different team. Then arbitration, general litigation, everything on the civil corporate side. Uh, we do not have a corporate uh, team. We do not have a transactions team. But apart from that, we uh, we do everything on the civil side, civil and corporate side. Uh, seven partners, total firm strength is 20 people based only in Delhi. Great, great. So, and, and how do you measure the success of your firm? Or what are some of the uh, highlights that was a legal journey so far? So, Success obviously is very, very relative. We have just started 2018. It's a very young firm. Two years, so it's a long, long way to go. It's just the start. Uh, I am 12 years into the profession. I still believe that it's just the start uh, because unlike sports people who have a shelf life for, say, 15 years, as lawyers, luckily, we our actual life starts after 10 years is what I believe because you have some relative experience at that point of time. So our firm has just started. The growth has been uh, satisfactory. So if you would have asked me in 2018 that you will have uh, a team of 20 people at the end of 2020, I would have taken it hands down with a lot of, uh, uh, with a lot of glee. So I'm happy. we are happy where we are, but we know that we are, it's just the start. As far as the highlights goes, uh, we do a lot of work. As far, if, if I start with my practice area, we have been lucky and fortunate that we are all, all majorly on all the online cases which are going on as far as competition law is concerned. Uh, where we are the Uber of the world, the uh, investigation against Ubers of the world, the Olas of the world, Amazon, Flipkart. We are on the other side. We are actually defending the uh, the small guys there. So it's the David versus Goliath fight where we are defending the Davids of the world. So, so far from my practice idea, yes, it has been quite satisfying. Our other highlights obviously has been getting a lot of engagement uh, in the WTO. We represent the government of governments of India in a couple of actions there. We are also defending government of Taiwan in our WTO action. Apart from that, obviously the general litigation stuff which is there. But these are this I would be I'd say the key highlight. 
so uh, if you can uh, so you have apart from that you have also written a book and many people are mentioning uh, over here they have worked with you in the past they have worked across you and uh, you know they have read your book on competition law so if you can like tell us some things about that like your personal journey with competition law how did you get into it and what has been so i have uh, so yes i've written a couple of books on competition law uh, my journey actually happened so i was always interested in market based uh, law mm-hmm. so i have always been interested in market based law so it's more of a i would say in other branches of law you will have some kind of a precedent some kind of a standard format uh, etc which is not never the case in a market uh, based uh, law So I was always interested in market-based laws. Right from in fact, I have read a lot about the MRTP, which is the predecessor regime also. So when the Competition Act did come in, uh, the okay. first, uh, uh, so I was very interested in it, and uh, by chance I started writing something or the other. And once it had a particular shape, I did approach the publishers, and they were kind enough to give a youngster a chance. So that was my first edition in two thousand nine. followed by i've read, uh, followed by i had a second edition in 2016 and so that is as far as an indian publication is concerned i have also written a book for cluvers walter cluvers that was in 2018 okay mm-hmm. so my journey in competition law has been uh, has been as far as so i've done a mix of both as far as work is concerned i have only been focused i would, I would not say only being focused but i would say 75% of my time has been on competition law But as far as academic pursuits are concerned, I have been doing some uh, writing in competition law itself. So that has been broadly my journey, both on the academic as well as on the work field. And I've also been uh, fortunate enough to teach a batch, one batch of Symbiosis Noida, for one of the semesters a couple of years back on competition law. After that, I could not continue because of work pressure, etc. But so overall, okay. I have been uh, trying to. Do something engage with the academia also. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, in your experience, uh, you know, how has you know many lawyers believe that writing a book and publishing is very critical and gives a big boost to their career. So, in your experience, writing the book has it made any difference to your career? What's the what has been your experience? So, this question I have been asked a couple of times. Uh, in fact, many times by a lot of a uh, lot of lawyer friends and my peers also. uh i can't pinpoint as to what has helped me and what has not helped me so it's very it's a combination of a lot of things i do believe that writing is extremely important because the quality of work that you write um uh, it actually attracts a lot of people uh, they know that you have been in this space they may not agree with what you have said but they will know that there is a view out there which is plausible which is uh, which is there so that can only be done by writing so that is one thing that i've always believed in as far as if you ask me has the book helped me as far as my business is concerned i would say in the indirect thing because while writing a book you always have to read a lot and while reading you will analyze and get more and more intricacies maybe from an outside perspective when i say outside the outside india perspective which will help me in dealing with clients when i discuss with clients on a one to one basis while doing my work or even otherwise it does help so it may not be the book per se but learning definitely while uh, while writing the book or writing any articles does it got it and how would you say that it has contributed to your branding or 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 you know um, you know standing uh, before peers etc because writing a book often has that effect as well if if there is something in your experience or do you think it's not that important hey right. I, i would so again like i said i do not if you ask me is it relevant or not relevant i don't think it can be put in a straight uh, jacket bracket like that okay. uh, yeah. definitely the international publication when you write so mm-hmm. my two other books is more dedicated towards students mm-hmm. when i wrote the international publication it was more more towards practitioners uh, where i'm giving although the content is the same because i'm dealing with the analysis of the same case laws but one i'm dealing more with the practitioners perspective does it help in in peer review as etc maybe it does help because peers may not have the time to read my books but i always uh, impress upon people whom i work with or whom i interact to write 800 words for any articles or blog because that is something that if say suppose i get an article i am traveling i can scroll on my mobile and read it and make a impression out of it so 
may not be the big books because that requires some time and some effort mm mm-hmm. maybe short clips articles which i also write on financial daily that may help okay so uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what led you to create sarvada legal and what was the inception point like when did you know that you are going to start your law firm i mean of course you found your uh, you know uh, companions and other other people to join forces with you but when did you personally know that this is something that you want to do and you were, were you looking for opportunities or was was this something that just happened no i would not say that it uh, it is something which uh, happened i have always uh, i've always had this inclination right or wrong to start something of my own and again like i said i think initially the wife the wife got but uh, when i say i wanted to start something of my own it was always with a team i have never believed in sole thing i have always believed in team something to do with maybe so i have always been inspired by cricket so cricket is a team game law right. is a team game everything is a collaboration and the Thank reason you. why i say so is because i may have a team in the sense i may be calling the shots i have people who are uh, assisting me but i do not think that's the way to go because you need people to also have a sounding board with board with both people who are younger to you people who are at your level at just to bounce of ideas and maybe right. you will not know everything from other branches of law of law which will he- help your interpretation in your law itself right so it has always been uh, like this fortunately among other people who are there three are actually from my college itself so one is my batchmate and two others are my one year my seniors so out of seven four are uh, my ba- uh, my my friends from college whom i know them very well uh with one of them i have been discussing on and off to start something of my own but then as luck would have it we all were in lakshmikumaran at some point of time where we interacted and we always believe that we want to start something of our own and then we were looking for the right opportunity you can't actually point out this is the right opportunity it's a gut uh, feeling at the end of the day and we took it in 2018 then so got it now uh, you know when you started uh like it's quite a challenging thing to find the right team and uh, more than team to find the right partners like a lot of people a uh, lot of lawyers run solo practices or even uh, i mean i mean it's quite hard to find the right co-founders and it's always a uh, i mean a tricky thing that you know whether the chemistry will work or not and how did you uh, like what's your how did things work out for you in 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 that way like how did you choose your partners what 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 the what was the criteria that you have in mind and uh, you know how how do you make a partnership work because having a lot of partners is not an not an easy task to keep everybody uh, into the same team and like you know in in fact it has been uh, in in some other interviews i did uh, you know uh, partners of big law firms often told me that one of the biggest challenges have been to keep the flock together and if initial founders stay together in a firm they often do very well but when the initial uh, founders leave leave the firm because of disagreements then uh, the i mean basically you remain much smaller and that has been seen across many many different firms uh, firms that have been really doing really well at some point because of conflicts between co-founders or simply disagreements or difference of vision they have separated and this is of, of course a very tricky situation because when you are initially starting a firm of course some people perform better some people may be not getting as much business but playing some important role in other ways or somebody's uh, you know work uh, you know uh, expectations from work may not be matching exactly and this is a very interesting uh, question that i have asked even in the past when i i interviewed sunit kataki from indus law for example and that's something that i want i would like to ask you also abir that you know because you're working with a large group of partners and how did you guys make it work how do you make it work now and what's your uh, process of selection see again uh, in our case it was more of a symbiotic relationship in the sense it was it was we knew each other from the beginning and we came together this issue comes in i guess one of the things where this issue crops up and it's again too early to tell and touch what it doesn't happen to our firm we are still a young firm uh what we intentionally avoided a situation was eat what you kill model we believe that every team is extremely important there will be some times where one team will get more work and the other team will get lesser work there will be 
times where one partner gets more work but the other partner doesn't get that much work we have made it very clear that we will not follow the eat what you kill model obviously the partnership stake among people different people will be different that was decided even before we started uh, uh that was an agreement that we had but we'll never or till the till time permits obviously every every year is different every circumstance is different it's just been two financial years uh but we have intentionally refrained from eat what you kill model we the moment it becomes an eat what you kill model then if suppose i get a work or rather somebody else gets a work which has to be executed by my team and the bill is say rupees 100 how much will be apportioned to whom it it becomes a bone of contention the moment you have that there will be disagreement so we have said that it's a common pool obviously there are resources which are attached and while we had an idea that all resources will work with everybody but practically it doesn't work because i will only give work to somebody who already knows the subject because i need to deliver to the clients right special utilization is also important yes, yes. resource yes. utilization is also important although we still try that everybody will work with everyone but practically it doesn't happen or uh, practically it's my experience that it doesn't happen but at the co-founders level we have made it very clear that we will not follow the eat what you kill model and this is right now the seven of us which are together who we know from very beginning when the eight like i said we do not have a corporate uh, law practice and this is one thing which we know that as a full service law firm which we need we'll deal with at that point of time as to how to deal with the situation when you have an outside person coming in right now it's seven of us so it's i won't say it's hunky dory every firm will have i won't say disagreement but it's always good to have uh, opposite uh, points of view so that you can discuss and come up with a common den- a denominator but right now we have refrained from each what you can model understood so i i am under, i understand that uh, most of you were fairly senior people i mean from the same college i am guessing same batch also uh, is, is that the case like all the seven partners no so uh, so uh, there are seven partners out of which five of us so uh, two of us are from 2007 batch two of us are from 2006 batch we four are from the same college the other two other so another one is uh, is our batch again 2007 and there are other two gentlemen who are who are senior to us who uh, both of them are 10 years our senior okay so um, and most of you were from nlu jodhpur right so yeah four of, from, us four of us were from nlu jodhpur okay great so so now uh, once you formed this team and uh, like well, how did it work like did you guys have a plan as to how you would be having work what work you would be having and you had a client list or did you start and then look for work if you can throw some light on that because we have had people like uh, who came and uh, shared that you no know, we just started we didn't have any idea where the next or the first or first 10 clients are going to come from and we just started and we did, and then we figured it out as we were going forward so i'm sure i'll get a very different perspective from you so uh, if you can share something about that like how were the how did you plan the first 6 months or one year and how did you like what was your strategy i'm sure you had a strategy in place before you started yeah so uh, again so let me divide uh, my response into two parts mm-hmm. one is our international trade division which consciously decided that uh, because a substantial portion of our work was already done in our previous organization that we will only do cater to new work as far as my practice area was concerned uh, uh due to the good wishes of the client client reports confidence in us and we had a lot of existing mandates which followed with us so it was not for us it was luckily by god's grace it was not a case of okay we have started on known when is the first piece of work we started our firm uh, so although we left lakshmi kumaran uh, on first of second of jan of 2018 uh we jo- we formed the firm on 4th of jan right from 5th of jan we had court appearances so we had existing right. mandates mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. had existing mandates so it was not a case of zero from day one yes the cash flows were an issue because all these clients have sap systems this is a point that we did not factor in we were thinking that from day one we'll start working we'll raise bills and it's like all of us are first generation lawyers we have never been on right. the firms so we we thought that we'll learn as it goes on the administrative side so this is one thing that we did not factor in that all the firms the have flow. sap sap system mm-hmm. so for example we move from one firm to another 
they have there are a lot of documents which are required to create a sap code hmm. so while yes. we had work from day one our cash flows only came in from may june this right. is the point we did not factor in right right that's a very interesting observation uh, so uh, in your uh, experience so in the first six months how would you describe the first six months and what are what were the teething problems the challenges you faced apart from this one that you already told us so what see uh, administrative issues were there uh, in the sense uh, are things which we do not even think about i would say for example taking a place on rent because we are very clear we will not work from home we needed an office space we wanted to not give an impression and this is our, our belief i have i have seen other lawyers say that we work from home for the first 2 3 months we were never of that point of view for our for reasons best known to us so we always said we'll have a so taking a space on rent there is a rent cost so that is that is a fixed cost all the fixed costs were were eating into us because it was eating into our savings because like i said and th- this happen so we were thinking of a lot of things that we will start because we, for example uh, my client list includes uh, by god's grace a lot of japanese clients so we were thinking we'll go to japan on maybe on the second or the third month and try to introduce that this is the firm this is the brochure this is xyz which we could not do because of cash flow issues so everything started waiting and then what happens is once work comes in it's a very chicken and egg situation do you need do you add more resources if you add more resources then you have to pay them and rightfully so but if the cash doesn't come in then work has to be done the work has to be done by us so we cannot do development activities and this is a challenge that we are facing till date how to come up with a perfect solution of work versus associate versus development practices so it's a, it's a fine balance you are always trying to you know like when to add more people and you know how how long it takes to ramp them up and all of that and whether to do that in the first place right exactly and this is a challenge that we found uh, for the first 6 months luckily the way we found i don't i won't say around it again we learned as it went uh, since i have taught in symbiosis noida there were a lot of so our firm is infested with two groups we have we are, at the top we are infested with nlu jodhpur at the associate level we are infested with uh, symbiosis yeah, noida and i know yeah and no i know that a lot of symbiosis noida people are there so they will yeah. must be smiling right now yes. uh, so symb- so what had happened was because symbiosis noida has this uh, concept of work during internship because it's noida bales are from the yeah, yeah. it's a very good culture that they have and yeah and, yes uh, and it it helps also which we never had Like yes, for Jodhpur, yes. you can't come to Delhi for doing an internship. It's only one month. Now you can do online internships. <laughs> online internship, yeah. And now everything is online. Yes, the... yes, yes. Uh-huh. So uh, to that extent, so these guys were there. Uh, a couple of them who have been there to, uh, from six months, they were continuously working. Yes, there was a. I always believe if you work, you need to be remunerated, whether at whatever level it is. But the cash flow obviously was low. The work quality was very good. and then they remain associated with us as associates right i think that is how a good team is built also like if it is built using money i mean when you i mean there are other problems that money cannot solve and when you are able to build a team without money then you have you have put the right dna in place for the culture right this so uh, yeah, yes, yeah. It's, it's a it's actually a question of buying into the vision of the firm because once i also the vision of the firm is obviously we all want to be profitable we all want to we want to attain a particular level at one point of life in terms of both the work that you do the money that you get everything is very important but okay, we have taken the obviously the entrepreneurial risk of setting up the firm but the, even if the juniors buy into the vision saying that okay fine i take a cut right now I, when i say cut i may not be able to get what a tier 1 firm is made, making but in course of time if the firm does well i do well too yeah everything yeah. equalizes at the end of the day you know it it is quite often that uh, you know maybe you a uh, 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 boutique farm or a smaller farm may not make uh, as much uh, turnover as a big law firm but definitely it is pro- possible to be more profitable per capita or you know even charge more uh, rates there are a lot of boutique law firms that routinely charge in their area of specialization more than what a big law firm also charges right so uh, would you agree with that no actually my uh, experience has been mixed mm-hmm. because there are matters where 
I would not say that I am charging because in my practice area, uh, that is uh, competition law, the major competition, uh, rather competition in competition law firms are from the tier one firms. So unlike mm. general corporate and M and A, which is there are a lot of firms and a lot of options. In yeah. competition law, I can pick only ten firms, and right, that, right. that too with a lot of. So I can pick first four very quickly, but then I will take some time to be, uh, uh, name the next pick. So for for so since the competition is that, it's not that I can charge more than tier one because tier one as it is charges a lot. But yes, sufficient enough. Uh, if for our level, so for sufficient enough for a firm like us, we are genuinely happy. But that is on the defense side. When you are the informant, so when I said that we are doing matters against Amazon, we are doing matters against Flipkart, uh, Ola, Uber, JCB, all the big names, all the big cases which are going on. It's a conscious call that you have to take because if you charge a hefty uh, sum to a trade association, they will not come. That to doesn't you. work. Yeah. Hmm. That doesn't work. But you have to. You need to get involved in the matter. In a way, it is also a business development effort for you. You know, in some. In, in a way, yes, it's practice development, business development. Even hmm. because see, you want to be involved in the biggest of cases where the biggest questions of law will be decided, and obviously it gives you the page, the page one, Economic Times, the uh, uh, coverage also that to uh, that to free of cost because those will be widely reported. So that's Absolutely. a conscious call that you you make. When you take on these matters, and this in turn, I will tell you a very unique story which has happened with me because I have we have been on such big matters. If you ask me, where do you get your biggest cases or where do you get your uh, uh, cases? So obviously we have all the efforts, but I, a lot of referrals I get from my peers. Absolutely. Because tier one firms may be conflicted in some matters. And while dealing with that conflict, they don't want that matter to go to another tier one firm. Yes, of course. So they will refer the matter to people like us, not because they are uh, not because they have seen us working. Yes. Opposite yes. them, they have seen our draft. So we make a conscious effort, whether we win or lose that case. At least our effort should be top notch. Yes, of course, of course. That's I so, think that's great suggestion and great advice for anybody who wants to build a law practice. Uh, if you can uh, tell us a little bit about when you when you started, uh, how did you manage to hire uh, good people? Because it's a, it's a big challenge that law firms face, uh, even big law firms face in you know, a treatment like the biggest constraint in growth of a law firm is being able to hire and retain good lawyers. And how do you guys go about it? And of course, in early days, it will be even harder. I'm sure every year it gets easier and easier as you build up processes and reputation and everything. But when you just started, how did you guys tackle the situation? And how did you address it? Like, do you have a policy or a, or a conscious strategy to attract and hire high quality lawyers? See, uh, I would say the reverse. The moment uh, you become more and more firm, then it becomes more process oriented rather than interpersonal issues. What we had done is when we started the team, uh, when we started our practice, we added people whom we have worked with before. That is on strategy one. Strategy two, like I said, long-term internship. So we like there were a lot of people who have done long-term internship, and a couple of them have already joined us in a permanent role. So that is one thing. So we know how they work. Obviously, obviously, the quality may go up and down, which happens all the time, all through the spectrum. Not every day is the same, which is which is understandable. But uh, at at the end of the day, we always hire people whom we know or who have a good recommendation for somebody. So we okay. have not come to a stage till where we have to interview people because I am very wary of how would you judge a person in five minutes? Of course, or half an hour or one hour. One hour. How how would you judge a person? I see a CV. I can ask a question. Somebody may be fabulous in speaking, but not that great in drafting, or yeah. vice versa. So, so you are saying that you prefer to hire people from internships or from senior people. You have get a reference that you see their work in court, etc., and then you prefer to hire such that, people. That, that's exactly right, and that's one of the things which is there that the moment the firm uh, increases in size, also, and hopefully it, we can ramp up because if we get more and more work, as to how to. Deliberate on the hiring strategy going forward, but as of now, we are only taking we have only taken people whom we have worked with before, and we are happy with their work. 
understood one of the challenges that uh, most law firms face is you know scaling work as your work increases even if you are hiring good people as much as you can still having the same quality that you started with becomes harder over a period of time because you know there's a dilution of that quality sometimes because a lot of new people coming in and it is easier to get work than to deliver high quality work from that is what most of the law firms agree on this and is that your experience and uh, what has been the challenge how do you address this issue that you know at the same time you want to grow and you want to keep quality really high so how is that even possible see for a for a young firm like us the way i see it is that not having a good quality is not an option not an option sure because we do not have the brand name because see whatever may be said about tier 1 or tier 2 firms they are tier 1 for a reason because they have been there done that done the biggest deals and if they make one mistake the clients will still be there because these are long term relationships yep and we are in the process of building we are still very young firm and young lawyers as as they say so for us our quality should speak for us so not having good quality it may happen it's not that it doesn't happen we may give uh, not so that the highest it. priority is on quality but how highest. do you, how do you make sure that because you are hiring people and you know even if they have good i mean of course hiring the best people is one of the strategies but after that how do you ensure that you know the quality i mean is there a strategy for maintaining quality like if you i i, I guess you have expanded to around 20 30 people now so we are 20 people uh, but none of the drafts pass through without uh, having a check from our end And right that's, that that is something so we are we have always been very honest with our clients in the sense that uh, we will never say this is uh, a draft which is subject to further internal review if we have given a deadline to the clients i make it a point to uh, maintain uh, adhere to the deadline but if the deadline is passed uh, if, because of quality because the draft is not good i'll tell the clients i need two more days because if the if i send it within a deadline but if the quality of the draft is not good nobody remembers that you have given the draft within that particular within time. the time yeah so somebody is asking amit is asking this is a question i want to take uh, what do you mean by quality so that's also an interesting so how do you define quality as a law firm and how do you uh, you know maybe so i de- i define quality by because we are in the litigation space i remember uh, my first uh, uh, boss mr this i telling me once in a joking manner but that has stuck in my head he says sun rises in the east everybody knows but there will be a case law which says that <laughs> yeah okay so i i i give a lot of emphasis on research etc so obviously uh, i'll never say that uh, it should not be well researched i'll never compromise on research so while the draft will have everything the draft should obviously read well it should be well researched and it should make some point and i want not always you will get a new point or something yeah but if it gets a like in competition law it's a evolving jurisprudence so right. every case is new so how yeah. have you advanced the jurisprudence if it can be done obviously in a simple letter to a cci asking for extension it's a simple standard format letter but if it is a pleading that's how if it, it doesn't make a uh, does it read well does it have all the points of law which is covered uh does it research well it's a compendium of cases ready etc so that's an that's an entire mix of quality and also whether it delivers the purpose yes. right like you know uh you know whether whether the yeah yeah i mean whether whether the the objective is met with, with what the work is and the quality of legal representation also maybe would you say like you know how good advice the clients are getting or how the process is or the process the experience they have while working with you with these things also yeah that is extremely see one thing what what do the clients want clients want that uh, to get the best advice at the best possible time uh but, so a uh, brilliant advice given 5 days after the deadline is as bad as a bad advice got it hmm. so the timelines are, i uh, promise the client which can be achieved at times i can be hard on my juniors but that's the only time i am hard otherwise i'm a very i believe that i am a very casual person <laughs> to deal with Great. uh i'm getting messages i'll see what my juniors are saying i'll take them to task if they're hearing this but otherwise as far as the deadlines are concerned i'm very 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 anal about deadlines and the quality of the world whatever quality that you mentioned and the uh, and the parameters i said uh, before those have to be maintained 
understood uh yeah. so when you started of course there are when you start there are certain challenges but as you start growing as an organization you have other challenges right so you have doubled in two years at more than doubled three times growth so in that uh, so there is a phase where you know uh, so how do, how did the prob nature of problems change over period of time like what were i mean what are the issues that you had to solve on the way so a major issues that you had to resolve before you could get where you are now okay again so it's uh, the issues keep on happening as to uh, so they will keep happening as you keep yeah. your journey of growth so that is you resolve one level you get to the next then you resolve that and you get to the next level so there would be some of the other challenges but what are the challenges that you already resolved if there is any learning from that so the challenges i'll tell you the challenges which are uh, which we are not able to resolve and uh, from what i speak to my peers across other firms they are also uh, facing the same challenge is something known as cross selling in mm-hmm. the sense if i have a huge uh, a cement company as my client and we are doing a tax work from them mm-hmm. logic would demand that if i have such deep relationship then it should also help in getting my other general litigation work also and mm-hmm. vice versa if i have some client then their tax work and other work should also come to us that is not happening and that we were thinking it's a given when we started but that's a challenge i speak to a lot of people everybody saying clients have become much more smarter when i say smarter in the sense a good thing because you would love to deal with people whom they know what to expect in an indian legal situation if somebody expects everything to be done from day one that means he doesn't know the indian uh, legal system. market hmm. indian hmm. market but having said that that cross selling is a huge issue so while we have ramped up till now faces of individual partners whatever work we have the next stage is a huge issue as to okay fine what is the next level of how much work i why am i not getting a work from a client which other other team is servicing understood so uh, uh, so that brings me actually to my next question that you know uh, in terms of business development what has been your strategy from the beginning and as of course you already had your own clients to start with but of course you would want to grow from there so apart from doing great work and letting your work speak for it do you have any other business development strategy or what what how did you approach things or how did you go about things as a firm and even personally if you can share some advice one thing is that so not don't take it me literally but uh, to an extent i am a shameless person in the sense if i have to reach out to some people i'll hmm. reach out to them but my mails what i try, what i what i try to do not always i'm not successful those are not cold emails in the sense if i'm going out uh, to meet somebody i'll not say i want to come and meet you because those things go in spam i'll try to read up on the person has he written something hmm say suppose hmm. he has written so for example the foreign lawyers connect that i make mr x he has written something on competition law so if i want to go and meet him obviously i will introduce myself i'll say i've read this of yours this is the indian situation so he will also feel i feel that he will also feel that i have taken interest in what he has done right so that also helps and okay fine i have already met a person through his articles what is his thought process even before i have met that person so that person will be more eager to for to meet it may or may not translate into work i have always been right. especially in foreign uh, foreign firms etc if you meet them today you will not get work before 1000 days from them right but you have right, to meet right. them periodically it's a it's a case of 1000 days so you have right. to plan it but you have to meet them minimum six times within those 1000 days right right so I, i'll tell you very i'll just take two minutes i'll give you a very inter- uh, interesting anecdote i was uh, meeting this uh, senior arbitration partner in a us law firm mm. and he was telling me that he referred a work to london firm for 20 years without getting anything back in return but on the 21st year he got a sovereign arbitration right right so 21st right. year he got a sovereign arbitration which as far as billing goes as far as recognition goes outflows everything so what i'm trying to say is that you have to build relationships right right and this too if if work comes you are lucky uh, god has been kind but you have to slog, slog and meet them there's no other option of meeting and the same yardstick if somebody wants to meet you he should also know something if i 
type Ramanuj on uh, Google, something should come out for me to interact when we meet. So you have to keep on writing. You right. never know who is watching you where. Understood. Understood. This is, this is, I think this is great advice. Uh, if you can, let's just talk about competition law. We have talked about generally starting a law firm a lot and like what has been, how things work. Uh, but you know, when it comes to competition law, you also described the market a little bit that there are, uh, it's mostly tier one law firms. So when you're starting, given this environment that there are only tier one law firms doing it, you being a startup firm just beginning. Of course, you had your many years of experience of yours and other partners, but even then being a new firm, uh, how did you weigh the market opportunities and did you see a uh, uh, space in the market where you want to position yourself and how did that go so far? I'll tell you the uh, biggest challenge that uh, we are facing and we'll continue to face for the next foreseeable future without any remedy is that let's divide the competition law workforce in a, any law firm. 55% of competition law market is actually taking merger control approvals in the sense if there is a big transaction, a uh, huge transaction like Sun and Baxi or Holcim Lafarge and the work, you need to go to the CCI to get their approval. Right. That is 55% of the practice of it and subject to correction, other law firms will say uh, uh, differently. 55% would be merger control, 40% would be litigation and 5% would be advisory. And this is my estimate. Understood. So for having 55% of the market, you need a very strong corporate practice in your firm because that is a feeder practice. So right. All these big tier one firms, why do they have such workers? Because they have a huge corporate practice, which is feeding them the competition of practice. Got it. Hmm. For me, that is zero. Yeah. If I don't have a corporate practice, I'm a young startup, I'll never get those big deals. Yes, I have collaborated with a couple of tier two law firms, but that is few and far between. I've done only two, three deals in the last two years, which is very few and far between. So I'm playing at a margin of the rest 45%. Understood. Hmm. And that also affects because since I don't have a corporate work, other people will feel that only these people will know the competition law and not a young startup. And this is a challenge which we knew from day one. It's not that I did not know and suddenly it dawned on me. It was a challenge which I knew from day one, uh, which I have been facing even from Lakshman Kumaran days also, because Lakshman Kumaran doesn't have a corporate practice. So I've been facing this in 2015. So it's not a new challenge for me. That is challenge uh, which is there, which I have to deal with for the next foreseeable future, unless we ramp up our corporate practice, which is still some time away. Right. Second right. is tier one. Now tier one firms, is a competition but then again they will never go against the big daddies because they have their conflict issues so yes i do do a lot of work on the defense on cartel space for mid and large cap uh, cap people but the largest the big daddies are, will always go to tier one because not because of competence but because of yes they are competent i'm not doubting their competence they're highly competent people but as an in-house counsel i'm driven by cya cover my ass if a person asks me, why did you go to a tier one firm? Yes, I went to a tier one firm. If they, if I did not get the remedy, what can I do? So as an in right. firm, I'll go to a big firm, which gives me an opportunity to go against them. Right. 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 Yeah. So you, be, you become the David in the David versus Goliath fight and have the right. same, uh, same uh, effect on the market. So basically, you found some empty spaces in the market which you uh, went for. Yes. And yeah. uh, again, so again, uh, not to, uh, it may sound a reiteration, but uh, it's actually true that uh, I have got a lot of help from my peers in uh, tier one law firms also. Absolutely. So that also Absolutely. relationship also is, and not only, it's not that I know them personally, I go out with a drink for them, nothing like that. It's just that I have, I have ensured that my work speak. And they have respect for the work that you do. All you, when I touch with, they have respected. And this is what happens throughout also. So Absolutely. for example, I'll tell you, when I left Lakshman Kumaran, we were servicing a big client and the big client was very open enough to say, I want to go with you, but I can't because of my policy, because I need to stay with a tier one firm. But because you have left, I need to go to other firms. So I referred them to a tier one firm with whom I have a relationship with. Right, right, of course, yeah. Uh, in in your experience, what is the uh, you know uh, impact of this COVID crisis on the on the competition law market, and how do you think 
uh, things will play out in the medium term and in the long term and in the short term also covid is something which is we do not know when it will stop when what what is it will to happen as far as my advice so this is something let me step back and not say competition law etc because i understand there are a lot of students lot of practitioners with us there no, I, i think people are interested in competition law the people who have come today there one way or the other they are either interested in building their law firm or you know getting so, so, so that's what i'm saying till or october they are interested in uh, competition law yeah. Yeah. so i'm saying till october you don't see any movement because uh, that will happen as far as new investigations which will continue after covid would be all these if you see all this face uh, mask sanitizers price doubling tripling in the market competition commission will definitely go after them because why did the price go up so rapidly so as to the, for the government to come in to say that you cannot go uh, and uh, they put a cap on those prices right uh, face mask which was 10 rupees how did it become 40 rupees so let the crisis be over let the work settle in they have already have existing work that they have to do but slowly and steadily there will there will be new investigation which will happen but not before october okay and a lot of uh, mergers and uh, you know uh, acquisitions are expected in in light of companies going bankrupt or or like you know in going uh, you know going into insolvency apart from that even that even prices fall down too much in the public market then some companies may get taken over or had have to sell out etc yeah. so do you think some uh, some merger control work may come through that yeah so we uh, as my, so what i understand and what i am uh, told is that because of this covid crisis a lot of deals which were in the pipeline obviously have been stalled but they will be revived with fresher valuations so the valuations have taken a deep dive so the trans for the so the companies which are cash rich will tend to acquire uh, acquire more uh, more companies yes. especially in the downstream market it's so, a great time to acquire companies yeah. you know yeah so essentially so what will happen is uh, is that companies which are cash rich will make more acquisitions and the moment you make more acquisition obviously there will be more merger control work so merger control work will increase it, it happen even after 2000 uh, it although the act was not notified it uh, the merger control came in 2011 only but as far as mna activity is concerned it increased post 2008 yes. and that is uh, that i am presuming will happen now it now also now also yes definitely so uh, uh, if you if you think of the 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 litigation side do you think that you know that may, apart from the this uh, people black market hearing during covid etc there is any other kind of things that may go up because uh, tech industry media industry growing larger stronger hey right. so, uh, see what will happen is that uh, it's it's a uh, it's a thing the medium and the uh, so i would say not so cash rich company will be eliminated i won't say eliminated from the market but to go to a point of uh, no return or they will take some point to recoup to the position that they were yeah but there will be less competition in the market so, so that will result in less competition so that's why i was coming to hmm. so because it will happen the only the cash rich companies will remain in the market for the for the next two financial quarters so to that extent obviously there will be much more uh, there there chances of more cartelization happening there some uh, dominance cases there so that we have to check as to how our post covid what are the government guidelines which can also be coming in they may just uh, put everything in essential commodity for some time so anything can happen it depends from time to time uh, but having said that yes yeah, the scope of competition of work will It's increase, increase. Yeah, mm. but post october post october as there is more consolidation there will be more opportunities yes. okay so uh, some people have asked what are your thoughts on online internships and and do you i mean how do you look at that and what what your observation about that because people are people want to work online and also uh, when when uh, lawyers hire i mean do you think it's possible to work very well on a on a remote basis see this is my first time ever uh, uh, which have been pushed to this corner where i'm working on a on an online basis and obviously work has affected because of the lockdown so mm. we are in a situation where there is less amount of work which are managing with existing people Mm. I've never had a. I will be very candid with you. I do not have opinion one way or the other. Mm. And this is my honest view. So, but are you I, trying? Are you going to try this out? 
we have not given i have not given it a thought and as a firm we have not given it a thought yet uh, this is my so, so one question like even even when let's say lockdown starts lifting after from 16th of april are you going to immediately go back to work or would you be still working from home because a lot of people i mean it it seems risky to go back to office immediately at this point we so again a call has to be taken closer to the date but if you ask my personal view right now i would say work from home till you have to go to court where you have to actually pick up files etc uh, if you can work uh, remotely then work remotely otherwise you but it seems even courts are pretty clear that uh, they don't want the risk of you know people coming physically and virtually virtual courts could be the no going forward because even judges wouldn't want to put themselves at risk and other lawyers at risk and the court staff at risk so i mean uh, we, yeah that is still the 14th uh, i'm not i'm very uh, no, after 14th uh, corona virus spread wouldn't stop so it will continue like we are at a we are at a very steep curve right now and it doesn't look like the infection will be stopped the no, no, i'm not suggesting that the infection will be stopped what i'm suggesting is right now the courts are taking urgent matters Which, right. which will not require a, such a deep review of all the files, everything which is there. Now, for an online, uh, online court proceedings to have some weight, all the files will have to be scanned. Everything will have to be done. So that logistic exercise will have to be taken. So till the time it is done, so we'll see how it actually goes. If it can be done, there will be some stage where you have to go to office at least to pick up the files. Something has to be done. So right. till the time, obviously. So we are not rushing into. If you ask my personal view, obviously the lockdown should be extended and court should all also be shut, and that will obviously happen. All the courts will follow the government directive in this. Absolutely. So we'll we'll yeah. get to know by twelfth what is happening. By fourteenth, all the courts will have their own uh, uh, circulars which will come out. So unless okay. it's absolutely necessary, at least for the foreseeable future, my view is we should uh, remain continue uh, to work from home. Yes. Okay, understood. Uh, you know there are a lot of questions that have come through. Let's start taking some questions quickly. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's a bunch of questions from Ruben Philip. Uh, your views on the new competition amendment bill, the best and the bad parts, and anything that were missed to be amended. This is one question. Then uh, many of the lawyers in the competition law space has taken an LLM in the same. Your views on it and the impact it has on prospective job opportunities. after in this space is it advisable to do it soon after college or later and then another question is it not advisable to specialize in one, only competition law in your career as it is too niche an area of law practiced by a handful of lawyers only in india so i think relevant question especially if you can take the second and third question one about you know llm in competition law is it necessary does it help or is it necessary i have not done an llm in competition law and right. and uh, i have my own reasons i think if you are doing llm and if you want to come back to india and that is my opinion which is at odds with a lot of people yeah. i think uh, i'll be blunt i think it's a waste of money because if you want to come back to india then uh, because llm is not counted as work experience anywhere right and it may not make economic sense is what you're saying yes. that you know financial calculations may not be yes. that great yes Just i know, i know of a lot of people who have done llm including my partners who have done llm and this is an at odds with their belief also i believe llm is not mandatory this and this is my personal opinion interestingly yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely and definitely that is the case with most of the legal industry uh, but peculiarly in competition law we have heard many times that some of the law firms also insisted that you know if you have a llm will prefer and in fact hiring only people with llm in competition law is that something that resonates with your experience yes yeah, so uh, there are a couple of firms quite uh, renowned firms which have uh, that to that extent so what they say that if you do an llm from kings college or somewhere else and if you actually want to enter into that firm itself then it's a, it's a path that they have given you have to adhere to that path but economically in my opinion you will spend 60 lakhs in an llm up or may you take an educational loan you are paying for the rest 15 years no point in my opinion especially in this market the dollar rate has gone to 
so my my although i have so when and also it, you may be able to compensate for it by working in a in a law, law firm like sarvada or even other law firm or working on competition matters in the end of the day experience and track record will trump just having some educational degree from my yeah, completely but and if you ask me i still want to do an llm then my suggestion is have some work experience and then go because then you can have a context because then how would you use the llm it's not by doing the llm but by yeah. making context you will go yeah, because of working and everything you will chances of getting work there would be much more you have professors who are partners in law firms who will come and teach you you can actually say the see what you are saying the indian context is this you make a rapport there so that is still yeah. better people take you more seriously also having you having some background right of course great so uh another question was about uh, you know uh, specialization in competition law is it too early like should you early in your career is it a good idea to specialize in competition law or should you like you know of course very few people practice competition law so what are your thoughts on this so even on this is very interesting my uh, my belief has also evolved over time if you had asked me a question a couple of years back i said specialize in competition law you can specialize in competition law now what i say is that you specialize in competition law but don't stop learning the other laws yeah, absolutely this is what we also emphasize on that yeah, specialization why, but continue learning other stuff why i am saying so is because hmm. i would say 20% of my time is non competition law i do insolvency work and other general litigation work my interpretation of the law has helped because of my other non competition right. law experience right. course, and general course. discussion with others and this is not only in competition law this is across board like you know so we say that you know you start by specializing at least you start by specializing but you will get the start getting the benefits of specialization quite soon but after that the only way to grow is that you keep learning other areas of law so as you keep adding new areas of expertise you become uh, you know a more desirable advisor and lawyer for for uh, your uh, absolutely in fact in most of the litigations which is done on competition law here one firms uh, and us also we uh, their team which does that matter particularly is a mix of hardcore competition lawyers in that team and a mix of litigation lawyers because it's all about strategy it's all about knowing uh, what the law is and also taking reference it's a new law at the end of the day the jurisprudence is not advanced so taking that how this clause is interpreted in reference statute which you can use it here so those things matter a lot so specialize but keep learning the other laws yes uh, but but your brand building and reputation everything is in one area perhaps but you continue to you continue to learn and and your brand will only increase when you can give more value and by you can give more value if you know the other laws know the other laws right so great fantastic so uh, how was the transition from a transaction practice to competition litigation shinoy is asking so my transition was very smooth in the sense i was too young i did only mna for 2 years so it was not like a tectonic shift in my head or something just wanted to do competition law at that time there was no law as such so i was doing mna out of uh, i don't say lack of option at that point of time i wanted to do mna if not that i be, i had been forced into mna because of lack of laws but when the competition act did come in i slowly gravitated towards that and it has been my so initially i wanted to do a mix of both but ultimately i gravitated completely towards competition law now to gravitate it back to competition law and other litigation so i have seen the entire circle awesome, awesome. there is a question from neha uh, suggestion for freshers if they are looking forward to join competition law team so <laughs> right now because so i want to because of this entire uh, crisis neha and uh, this is an honest response don't get me wrong uh, right now obviously it's very difficult and this is as honest as i can be it's nothing to do with anybody's competence i want so even if even if somebody continues to develop their interest in this it's okay if they get a job next year in june uh, 2021 i mean it's nothing happens overnight right so if somebody wants a job next month sure it's a terrible yeah. time but it's a great time to build relationships do build your expertise and write stuff and get noticed by people so even today you might have a little more time to spare for them rather than you know when 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 you're a little freer 
so if you want if somebody wants mentorship it's a great time to reach out to lawyers so there are problems but i think there are great opportunities also so you tell this to our students so for example people lot of a lot of our students internships got cancelled in tr1 law firms tr2 law firms internships got cancelled because of covid and may at max they are being told okay you write some article and we'll give you a certificate now that is not working serving the purpose but what we are telling them is this is a great time for you to actually get certain internships that you won't get otherwise you know talk to people they need help people are writing people are many people are quite busy right now reach out to them see how can you actually help them rather than just write articles so uh, and there are opportunities right just you need to take a different path so whenever there is a disruption there are opportunities get created okay. and absolutely so i'll tell you a statistic which came out a couple of days back i uh, Uh, I saw that uh, link, traffic on LinkedIn has increased three times after the COVID has broken, and this is a worldwide <laughs> statistic. Awesome. How to take advantage of this? And I, this I have been telling law students uh, whenever I meet, etc. If a CV is given to me and somebody writes expertise competition law, it's too broad. Yep. If yep. I write an article, I'll ask questions on that article. Then I will know how deep you have done the research. So, like you said, it's a great time to write articles. Yes, you may feel, and this is. uh it it is a time where everybody is feeling very very tense people who have job offers will our job offers go who have internships it has already gone like you are saying it is a time for students and try from students to the managing partner of tier one law firms everybody is tense so being tense is fine like you said take advantage and write articles write good topics and shamelessly send to people reach out to people ask for mentorship you yes. know do stuff of course many are attending webinars which is great yeah. i think everybody is organizing webinars which is also great okay. uh, yes yeah. so this is the time for knowledge dissemination knowledge dissemination right yeah. and so, also uh, zoom zoom sessions zoom so and i'll take the opportunity to also plug in our competition law course so we have a fabulous course on competition law okay. uh, that we are uh, we have been offering for a while and we have several of our students have joined uh, tr1 law firms and even other places uh, in fact you uh, shweta rat who is to work at trilegal in competition team and uh, she is uh, she is also with us working full time and she is uh, leading our efforts on our competition law yeah, course i know i know shweta because uh, there's a matter again like i said i worked against tier one law firm so when she was she was a trilegal i have met her in court so i know of her yeah so she has total 4 years experience in trilegal and then also at compact she was uh, doing litigation so overall you know um, we have uh, like uh, and and our course is very practical focused so we we do not uh, just deal with the theoretical aspects but actually the drafting and you know uh, actually the problems people face while litigation etc that we cover even merger control we cover you know the, the practical aspects how the work is done so that if somebody is interested do i i will share a link and in fact i would even leave my number if anybody wants to talk about it later please reach out uh, yeah so if if there is anybody from my team you can share the link also of the course in the chat maybe people can check it out that will be really helpful uh, uh, for me okay so if you can quickly tell us you know uh, your uh, any other question you want to take by the way there are a lot of question we haven't been able to take time is uh, formally over but if you want to take a few more questions we can take and uh, i have taken so i am available till you let me go oh, or till uh, or till my baby starts disturbing me which is okay <laughs> okay okay great so there is a question how did you get your first client and this question has been repeatedly asked by many people so maybe you can take this as well how did i get my first uh, individual client uh, i'll tell you so uh, i'll tell you the example so obviously first uh, client was again to my peers which will not help much in the discussion but i'll tell you how i got the client which i am representing against uh, amazon and flipkart was this gentleman used to give a lot of quotes against this uh, big companies etc so i wrote to him on linkedin uh, saying that you can also explore this angle so something uh, something in addition to what he is already doing he said come over for a meeting okay okay great and this happens there a lot of so i'll tell you the ratio of success is 1 is to 100 So you have to reach to hundred people shamelessly. You will get one client. 
Yeah. So you have to reach 200 people. I think that's a great uh, mindset. I tell people that you reach out to 10 people, one will say yes. But yeah, if if you are ready to reach out to 100 people and ready to hear 99 no's to get one yes. There will be no knows, there will be silences, there will not be any responses. Yeah, like and, that. But that mindset you cannot beat. You know that once you are ready to even hear a no and you are ready to go a uh, hundred times to get one client. I mean that mindset is very hard to beat and I think that is the DNA of entrepreneurship. So that's I really think important. what you need to ask yourself, do you respond to every message? If the answer is no, you can't expect every person to respond the same. <laughs> right, right. And you don't need uh, 99 yeses, you need one yeah. yes. Right? yes. So, yeah. And that's a uh, starting point. And if you can get one client, then you can get two and then you can get 10 and so on. Yeah. So that's great. Uh, Sumit Kansal wants to ask a question for a long time. Let's, let us allow him to... Uh, you want to come online, I think. So I'll unmute you, Sumit, just a moment. Let me see, Sumit. Yeah, Sumit, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Abdul, for a wonderful session. Thanks, Sumit. So, um, I have a very busy kind of a question. I have a law practice, uh, somewhat like you, but I'm practicing mainly into the NCLT forum and uh, commercial laws. So, like a person like me who is not uh, much into the uh, CCI or the appellate forum of NCLAT in the competition law matters. How do you, uh, what would you advise? Uh, because the uh, the clients are basically the conglomerates and how, how could we take this kind of work, especially into competition law? Uh, not going to CCI, not, see, one thing is there is that because the, all the appeals, so let, let's take the NCLAT example first and then I'll come back, I'll go the other way around. Because now NCLAT is dealing with both CCI matters as well as IBC and other company law matters and you do a lot of internet work like you said it will not be difficult for you because the person hearing the matters is the same so you know the outlook we had Justice Mukhopadhyay till now obviously he's not retired I see a smile on your face and I'm, mm. I'm replying with a smile myself <laughs> and nothing more should I can say but that will be an advantage because you can say that while the law is specialized mm -hmm. the person hearing the matter is the same I know that how the person reacts to a particular situation. Apart from that, competition law is essentially, just to put it very, very uh, simply, there are four substantive, substantive sections. So all these conglomerates, the way you should, like I started, uh, what I did was offer them training. Offer them, see, they will never, uh, like you said, a huge conglomerate will never come to a new practitioner for an existing matter. Mm -hmm. And they will, they, if they come, very well, but nothing like it. But then we have to uh, count our uh, blessings a lot. But generally, you have to start with training. You have to show your own expertise so that they can trust you. I understand that you deal with them in other matters, other non-competition law, other legal work. So you can you use that example. You must be reviewing their contract. Okay, fine. If the contract has a competition law provision, you also include this. So you have review of contract, the basic stuff, the uh, basic stuff, which again, like I said, is only a 5% of the practice, but that gives you a foot in the door. Right. I okay. got that. Great, great. Thanks for the question, Sumit. Right, thank you. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, one question that I have seen very interesting as going through the lot of uh, comments that have come and one not um, some of them have already been answered. And one interesting question that I can see uh, is for, is basically, you know, if there is a uh, law for uh, so so basically the question is if compare com trying to compare the work life balance of competition law versus other areas, right? So is uh, can we say uh, that you know uh, working in competition law is a little better than uh, working let's say in uh, general corporate or litigation in a big law firm or, or 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 even other law firms for that matter or litigation even for example see you are doing a lot of litigation of course but maybe you can uh, tell us you know how it compares with other sort of work see an out and out litigator uh, which i'm not i do a part of litigation but I won't say that I'm an out and out litigator for them actually Saturdays are all Sunday is very hectic because Monday there are a lot of admission matters every I honestly work life balance is something uh, I, I've never understood uh, the, we all wanted the work life balance but if there is work what can you do you need to <laughs> you, you need to deliver you want a situation when there is more work yeah no but like, there are, there is work -life certain uh, certain areas Abhi, that are very clearly like that like for example we know that 
you know uh, if you are in the capital markets team probably you spend more time in the office than anybody else on the other hand if you are doing uh, in a, say i i mean if you are doing ip contracts and not litigation then you might not be having that bad hours because uh, in litigation there are sort like sudden emergency situations that you face so there are areas which are emergency matters and you are closing deals it's just crazy so but comparatively advisory things which are more advice heavy may not be like and maybe more control over time so for example people working on gdpr or take advisory for example they are having a little more control over their time so given all of that how does competition law fare and i'm sure i'll understand if you say merger control is so different from uh, let's say uh, litigation in competition competition law hey not necessarily so merger control is obviously much more you have to do a lot of things so capital like capital market you said the reason because there are a lot of small small compliances which have to be done similarly in merger control not to the extent of uh, capital market maybe but when you have to file say on today you have to file the last the three days preceding today will be very very tough and same is the case with competition or litigation if you have to file a pleading or if there is a hearing coming up the preparatory time takes a lot i think a lot of time uh, is uh, i because i have been in uh, other tier one firms also is actually the time when they these guys all start they also start at 2 pm not early so right. capital market is obviously a different ball game altogether but if you start in time obviously you can finish earlier but it all depends on the flow of work it's good to have a work life balance when there's a when there's both work and life when there's less work obviously you have more life when you have more work than life takes a second bit uh, okay so there's an interesting question from cornell vp karad okay uh, he is asking i am going to be a lawyer this year as in my last semester of llb guide me to start practice as an independent lawyer from day one see independent lawyer are you a first generation lawyer or uh, yeah let's yeah. assume first generation yeah. so first generation lawyer obviously uh, will be uh, if you are wanting to do litigation you join somebody's chambers uh, whether it's a small uh, law firm or a practice or a simple chambers etc because day one you will not get uh, for the first 10 years of law practice i always believe you have to give uh, obviously money is extremely important and uh, extremely extremely important but it should be self sustaining it should not be a sole thing if you start practicing from day one like this year you have to give it to a firm so that you get matters you get files so yeah, or, or you have to be a g- really good at uh, you know generating clients for yourself something which, which will not ha- which which may happen i'm not saying it won't happen etc but the chances of that we have to live in a life of probability sure, so sure, the sure. chances of that happening would be less yeah yeah okay and we are going to are uh, going to interview even they are we are lined up interviews with some people who started their practice from day one on their own and uh, that uh, webinar i will attend them <laughs> yeah but that 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 will be like interesting you know so uh, they'll share and many of them privately told me that they even given a choice they might not do it again you know so and and some people said you know there are pros and cons so that will be interesting in you so uh, so there is a question which is interesting uh, very interesting question uh, how uh, apart from like you know high quality work what else do you do to retain your clients some people do newsletters and stuff this is being asked by kashya venkate so you have any thoughts on that yeah, so new, newsletters um, people often uh, uh, don't give that much importance to newsletters but i give a lot of importance to newsletters even if they go in spam because it is a recall value somebody is doing something and that's obviously a challenge that we face because if there is work then we do not have a team or people resource to do on newsletters but i believe newsletters are extremely critical uh what can be done is obviously you will have a newsletter and you will send it to whatever your contacts are say 100 contacts and this is something which my again in nishid sir somebody taught me and which which i try to do but not to that uh, effect which i want to do is that a mass email will go to 100 people and then you follow up with forwarding that same email to say mr x saying that why is this newsletter important to your business say i have written something in labor in covid right now it's a yeah. guideline you yeah. are a, not a cash rich company can you lay off 
can you if you don't lay off can you ask for voluntary resignation they will pick it up change the subject line but forward the newsletter with your pointer this is something that is done but newsletters are writing is extremely important in my view yeah sharing dissemination of information because you have yeah. expert information if you keep disseminating it it creates great value for your your existing clients so great uh Okay, so uh, somebody is asking to summarize the pointers for how to get work as a new law firm. I do. I think that will be too much. Uh, there are some questions on uh, instance. Okay, if you can't find a job in competition law right out of college, which practice area will help eventually to make a transition to competition firms? Question by Swagata Banerjee. Saksham Mali. Yeah. Saksham. So I would say uh, do litigation. Join our chambers. uh which does commercial litigation mostly in tribunals like nclt and nclt and it also depends which branch you you want to do merger control then obviously join a corporate team but if you want to do litigation join a chambers because the, as i was mentioning to sumit also some time back because the forums remain the same now it's not that it's a dedicated it's not like electricity tribunal which is a different tribunal altogether it's the same forum it you can make the shift so join a chambers Where the presence of that particular gentleman or the senior counsel or the uh, designated who is senior to you does a lot of appearances there. So that is one thing that can be done. You got it. Okay. So there is a question by Anurag that if someone has done general litigation for say around two years, move into specialization, does the said person get restricted to that specialization? Context is context is one may have multiple interests. I mean, what is your think about thought about this? Like, is there any option of not specializing, specializing in today's world? And is it? Do you? I mean, what is better to specialize or not specialize as a litigator? I think I, I think there's no straight jacket answer. It's uh, I have I've seen a lot of general litigators doing exceedingly well. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of specialized litigators, specialized firms who are also doing exceedingly well. It's actually your journey. Your I can't say one way or the other. Uh, because today I may say something, and after five years you will find me doing something completely differently. Uh, That's like, true, but in the in the beginning of a career, when you when you target a wide area of law, it takes a long time to even get started. So when you have a smaller niche that you target a smaller niche in which there is less competition, etc., it might just I'm mean, not just might for sure it helps to you know get started and get your first. Uh, you know, food. Right. And I, if you're working under somebody else, that's a different thing. But as long as you're working, you know, you're trying to build something for yourself. I mean, I don't think there's any option but to specialize. I mean, we. I mean, right. it it depends on. First of all, it mean. depends on whose chambers and which law firm are you joining. If it is a tier one firm, it will be you will be put in a, a bracket tier Special one, tier two, tier three, whatever firm. The chambers, if you join a legal chambers, it depends on what your bosses are doing. So you will end up doing the same uh, kind of work which is there. If it is completely independent, uh, like one of the gentlemen just asked, then I would say you have to start at least for the first year as as a general litigator. You yourself do not know what your specialization is. It's good to what is your interest? You discover your interest. You now. discover your interest as we go along. So, right. for example, I know of a lot of people who have gravitated from corporate uh, corporate to competition law. Mm -hmm. All these comp. So, for example, the big names in competition law right now never had competition law as a course then. Right. Because the law is new. Yeah. So uh, there is one interesting question from uh, what would be your message? I mean, there's a lot of questions about how should freshers get a job in competition law. I mean, overall in different different languages, that is the question. So, what you want to say something about that? Like, so, what could they? What could they do? I think the only way. Uh, Especially in this market, uh, and in fact, I had advised one of my uh, people I know also. You have to write to them asking for internship. Mm -hmm. Right now, there are firms who will give you internship online or uh, face to face when the time permits, etc. And you have to show your worth because right now everybody will be in a. I don't know how the law firms will react to this present situation. Otherwise, also you have to do an internship with them. That increases your chances to uh, to get get a job opportunity. Obviously, you have to be lucky. You have to intern at a time where there's a lot of work. Associates, senior associates, principal associates of law firms give you work, and then the partner ultimately hires you. So it's very essential for 
non nlu when i say non nlu not that i'm doubting their competence at all it's just that nlu is have a better placement and this is a fact more and systems I, are there more more NLU. systems are there and again like i said i have uh, stood, i have people from sibasa nada i really admire what they are doing except is they are no way lesser than an nlu people but that's how the world is right now absolutely and, and if 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 anybody wants to i actually written a 300 page book on this how how non nlu students can do 10x better than nlu students okay so you can just google this and find this book free of cost you can download it and read that i mean how you if this is ever a question i'm going to ask you a question abhi you know i this is the strategy we have taken i'll share it with everybody anybody can implement this so what we are doing for our students is this number one we are asking them to write articles and build up a repertoire then start approaching people in those areas so we must we might ask people you know why don't you write to abhi share your articles and ask that if you can assist in any research or in any kind of uh, you know any any other writing research kind of help and right now if you write to people for internship they may or may not agree but if you write to them saying that sir or ma'am i want to i i have done this research in the past and i have written this is the quality and i am i would love if i had an opportunity to assist you in your research or writing because nobody does this right simply it will it will stop working if everybody starts doing it but right now nobody is doing it okay so it's working like anything for our students provided that they are they have that you know first to show also that you are you are able to write because abir is not going to work with somebody whose english grammar is bad or somebody who doesn't know abcd of competition law so if you can show that yes you have done some work there's a track record then it would be really easy for abir to say yes it's it may, i mean what do you say abir would you say no to somebody coming and uh, offering that kind of um, showing a track record and offering to help you no, in this question obviously obviously there's no end to somebody does a Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, one of the like one of the people that uh, we have taken on a long term basis from Sibasis, who we have just confirmed was he got a case on a proposition of law from a uh, I think EU or Canada, I forgot uh, which one, which is directly on the point. Which after two years on working on the matter, we could not find. Couldn't find, yeah. Hmm. So some people just have a knack of good research. what i would go a step ahead is when you approach these people also do some research on what matters they are doing or because you will have cost titles on all the matters you know xyz has done this matter somebody wants to approach there is no point such a great advice such a great advice write an article which is contrary to what they are arguing right which is good. fantastic yeah so mm. do mm. one level better research we are going to implement so, this now in so our our research on the individual so we, for all our courses we have a placement office and they are always working with our students to give them this idea so now i'm going to put this idea into uh, what you just said that you know look yeah. up the course titles and find the lawyers you want to work with and find out you know what they have argued and you know give them like I like write articles about that and reach out. Definitely, they're going to read and definitely they're going to respond. What a brilliant! One idea. more thing that yeah. I would suggest is, apart from the partners, also look at senior associate and principal associate. Absolutely, partners absolutely. Partners at times, not because of anything. At times, they may That's forget busy. to respond. They yeah. may forget to respond, yeah. and a lot of people are hesitant in writing to people twice or thrice. Don't make any pre-judgments to what for extent whatsoever. Yeah, Be- yeah, because a lot of people ty- people are busy. It's just not the right time. No, we see that people start responding. So we tell our students to they write articles regularly. Every month they have to write one article, and we say that you send it to at least thirty people in the industry which in which you are interested. Correct. And when they send the articles, most of them don't respond. Correct. And then they like, if I, I say, so what? They are they are reading it. Trust me, they are reading it. You send it again. Now, first time they don't respond. Second time they don't respond. When they see five or six articles you have sent. then suddenly there is a familiarity and they they can see the commitment that you have you know you are not somebody who just sends one article and disappear anybody can do that but when you have written six articles over let's say 3 months and on a certain theme around and they can see the commitment and that time it makes a big difference you know somebody uh, who is not going to respond otherwise will respond after the 6 7 articles when in fact, in fact you should tell your students to follow the Japanese torture method. In the sense, what they do is they don't <laughs> electrocute people. They don't hang people by their Chinese have, water torture. Yeah, so they will put water here repeatedly. Yeah, drop, yeah. drop, drop, drop. So, drop, so yeah. this is what you have to do. Huh. Reach out to people. In don't stalk them. 
go one step lesser than stalking them but yeah but sending an article and all of that sending an article I mean, you know, not your own article you share some good article that they might you Perfect. know enjoy reading say suppose uh, there is some uh, proposition of law which they have argued for example which you have seen maybe this is a case law which i thought would be relevant to you everybody wants to find new information even if say suppose i have already know that information i may have already have the case law, but just because i may have taken 5 days to find the case law if that person finds me in one day i know that that research skills is impeccable and i there is a person who we have to keep in mind absolutely and the same thing works for business development you do the same thing with clients in future you will get clients right yeah so great so this is fantastic uh i think i think we have uh, you know i i think we have covered most of the things the only thing i will add is that you know uh, how we help is that when you when you are an intern sometimes you can if you know the work that is going on so people who go and intern they don't have a clear picture of what the lawyers do so for example somebody who attended today's session will have a more clearer picture of what kind of work is going on now what we do is that if you are work on a course with us we would be uh, trying to give you the work on a on a on a practice we will make you so the tasks that a first year associate second year associate does in a law firm that work we will give it to you as assignments every week two assignments every week and once you solve the assignment then our lawyers who have experience of working in competition law will give you feedback as to how you can improve it and we look at this as a way to like say the way if you keep practicing piano or you keep practicing karate you improve month on month so while you are not getting to work in a law firm if you come to us and we can train you like that in competition law that every week we will give you two assignments you solve it you get feedback then there is a live classroom online like this online classroom but the classroom is not the only thing the online classroom is followed uh, following after all the work that you have done through the week and then there is a live classroom to discuss with an expert yeah. by repeating this process month on a week on week right every week you work on two new skills so by that uh, so our competition law course is 3 months long so by the end of 12 weeks you have learned around 24 skills and you have practiced them repeatedly so it gives you a certain confidence when you go for an internship or even an interview you are able to uh, have an edge over anybody else who hasn't gone through this process so oh, that would sh- shine in your work in your will show up in the work that you do the dis- Research that you do, the conversations that you have with anybody, so you you come across as very well prepared. Yeah, yeah, Makes sense, Charles. It is it is extremely helpful. In fact, see more than anything else, you are putting in them in a regime, which regime. Is the same discipline. You have to do the skills, and if you do the same thing over three months, you will develop some of the other skill, or you will just uh, hone it better, which is always essential because for the first one year in a law firm, you have to do everything. and it has nothing to do with law you obviously have to do pleadings take prints do clippings bindings the work yep. so so everything the more you have people who like yourself who have already worked in law firms who have uh, friends there the more they interact you will also know that uh, w- what is the uh, uh, what is the level of skill aptitude which a junior lawyer should have yes great so uh this is great and uh, i think we have covered a lot of base today and it's anyway one one and a half hour already so we are going to uh, so nagaraj has been asking this question what is the market size of competition law uh is it only restricted to delhi so i think these are important questions maybe you can you can answer this see logistically because it's uh, i won't say it's limited to delhi i know a lot of uh, and there are leading lawyers who are based in uh, mumbai when i say leading tier one top of the notch who are based in bombay uh, who travel to delhi but they are also servicing the big clients so they don't mind paying that extra premium because of the lawyer yes i won't say it's limited to delhi people from bangalore the big cities uh, also come because the jurisdiction of the ccs throughout but the delhi lawyers fortunately unfortunately the way you see it will have an edge because the location of the cci is in delhi so i know nagraj runs a law firm in bangalore so i'll quickly share this my assessment is that bangalore will have a lot of competition law work going forward simply because there are so many startups which are so well funded which is grown big you know and the deals will be happening there will be major control there will be issues so there will be local lawyers they, they will need local lawyers who can advise and surely big law firms have an advantage if they have you know a competition law team but even as a small lawyer working with such clients i think there's a there's a vacuum in 
places like Bangalore for future computational practice. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, I think we sh- it's time uh, we wrap up. So uh, thank you so much, Abir, for the time you gave. RT is asking, can we have Abir sir's contact number? What is the way to reach out to you, even if you don't want to share your contact number? No, you what can is give the way me email. You can give me email address. Not a problem. Okay, so tell me your email address. I'm going to type it out in the chat. Abir, can I type it? Should I type it out? Sure, sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Type it out in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Just make sure it goes to everybody. I mean, there's a everyone option to yeah, everyone. Great, you got it. So excellent. So so uh, thank you so much, Abir. It was a really enriching session for me. There's thank so much so that much. I learned today. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I think I hope uh, if everybody can also share your feedback on the session, how how you liked it, and you know if any improvements you can think for us, Lossico, that we can do better. Please do share uh, share your feedback in the even in the your respective WhatsApp groups which you're part of most probably, where you get the notification of this. these uh, webinars please share your feedback there uh, it would be wonderful and uh, and do uh, stay in touch there are a lot of more webinars coming up thank you very much and thank you so much abhi hope to have you again soon and share and learn more insights from you thank you so sure, much sure sure thanks everyone stay safe see you soon